Well, a bit of a review uh, before we get into chapter 15. We have been talking about Abram is the father of our faith. And we looked at in Romans chapter 4, we looked at that last few weeks, chapter 4, verse 16, that says, Abraham is the father of all who believe. He's still called Abram at this point. Soon we're going to see in a few weeks, we're going to see that he'll be called Abraham. Why is he the father of all who believe? Well, he's the Old Testament example of the New Testament believer. In other words, he is the model of how we all grow in our relationship with God. We have faith in God when we believe, but we don't have the faith sometimes, oftentimes, to trust God for the next thing. And so he takes us through, he gives us opportunities to trust in him as we go. The first words of chapter 15 uh, are the words, after these things, after these things. Well, after what things? Well, after the events of chapter 14. That's usually how it works. 15 follows 14. We talked about how Abram wasn't ready for chapter 13 until he had made it through the faith tests of chapter 12. And even though he didn't do so great in that chapter of his life, we did see that he still had a heart for God. And in chapter 13, we saw that he made some hard decision to break ties with his nephew. He decided that that relationship was a hindrance. God told him to leave his family. He didn't leave his family. At first, he came with it. He brought his father along. Then he brought his nephew along. And the Lord had told him, leave your family. And we find ourselves sometimes when the Lord says, I want you to set aside. Uh, you've got that friend, that family, whatever it is in that inner circle. They need to be in the outer circle. They're hindering what I want to do in your life. And again, we established that's not your spouse we're talking about. That is maybe a relationship. You may know what I'm talking about that is hindering your walk with God. And, and Abram made that hard decision to say, Lot, you go your way, I'll go mine. And then in chapter 14, he's now ready to move on. We saw that he, he still has a challenge, and we said that he has to rally the troops and then go save Lot and many others and the women and the children because they have been taken captive as several kings, five kings versus four kings, the kings of the north, kings of the south, they all came together. And he rescues them at 85 years old. He goes and, and steps out in faith and amazingly rescues Lot and the others. And after that, he comes face to face. Right after the battle, he comes face to face with Jesus, a Christophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus. We see him here as Melchizedek. We saw over in chapter 14, you can look at it with me, verse 18, it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, or king of peace, brought out bread and wine, looks like the, the elements of communion. Now he was a, a priest of God, king and priest. Those offices don't mix, but in Jesus they do. A priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so again, we see he's taken these steps, and, and his doubts, his unbelief, sometimes really, most often, his fears are outweighing his faith. And again, I find that encouraging because we find ourselves faltering. We can find ourselves doubting and unbelief. And, and then the Lord has to just say, I'm still with you. I still got you. Let's move along. Let's learn from that and go to the next thing. And that's what we see in Abram as he's growing in his relationship with God. And so he meets with Melchizedek. He meets with with Jesus. Uh, some, some sources think this was just a type of Jesus. I happen to believe that it actually was Jesus uh, showing up just like he did in the Garden of Eden as well. Abram often blew his testimony, but he is growing and God never gives up on him. This is why he's the father of faith. We've blown it too, but God doesn't kick us to the curb. He never gives up on Abraham, and he never gives up on you and me. So it is after these things. Going back to that first phrase of, verse, of chapter 15. After these things that God shows up again to take him where? Well, to the next step of his faith walk. Verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Underline the word vision. Saying, do not fear. Underline, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. So the Lord shows up to him this time in a vision to him. 
So a few things that we see here as far as this vision is concerned. He speaks to Abram in a vision, not a dream. The dream will come later. A vision can be in the day, in the night, anytime. But God says to him, do not fear. This is the first time God speaks in a vision. And by the way, the first time it says the word of the Lord came. So God says, do not fear for the first time. A lot of first. Genesis is the book of first. Why did he have to tell him, do not fear? Well, whenever God shows up, there's this holy fear that overcomes someone. When God shows up in a vision, in a dream, and uh, just during prayer, God draws close. There's this holy reverence. But why else? Well, he's just departed from a victory in which he rallied his 300 men and his troops, and they defeated, they traveled how many? 400 miles, 100 up, 100 further, and then 200 back. They've been traveling a lot. They're tired. When you're tired, you tend to be more vulnerable. And he comes back, and he's thinking, you know, those kings could retaliate. Those kings could come after me. And so he's got that fear. He's got the holy reverence fear. He's got all this going on. Many today in our world are afraid. Maybe if you've looked at the news or maybe if you've allowed some of the stuff that, that's said and goes around, fear may have captured your heart. Anxiety may have moved in to your own heart during this season of this world that we're in. And it's possible that he had found himself afraid and many of us found ourselves afraid thinking, oh no, what happens when we do that? Why do we find ourselves, people of faith, afraid sometimes? Well, because like Abram, we get our eyes on the circumstance rather than on the Savior. We get our eyes on the problem rather than the one who holds all the solutions. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. If you just want to jot it down, I'm just going to read it to you. 1 Peter 5, verse 7 says, Casting all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. How do we know that God is going to be able to relieve our anxiety? Because we know he loves us. We know he cares for us. And so we know we can go to him. So God sees Abram's fear. And therefore he says, don't be afraid. <laughs> he, he sees his heart. He knows him. He cares. So he says, don't be afraid. Don't worry. I'm here. I got you. What else do we see in verse 1? He says, do not fear, Abram. I am a what? Shield. Underline the word shield. That's a picture of protection. He sees a promise of protection. Protection. He's going to protect him. He's going to cover him. He's going to take care of him. If we're afraid, it's good for when the Lord says, I'll protect you. A lot of times we're thinking, I need whatever to be, you know, I need uh, an alarm system. I need the, well, you know, it's good. To, why is it to do certain things like that? But where is our real peace coming from? From trusting in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight and he'll bring peace. I'm a shield to you. What else does he receive? What are the promise? It says, your reward shall be very great. So he receives a promise of very great blessing. A promise of blessing. It says your reward shall be very great. We don't know how much time passes sometimes between chapters and verses. The Holy Spirit has um, ordained and told Moses what to include when he wrote and when he scribed these pages. Many of it was handed down orally and they wrote it down. But the Holy Spirit led the end result. So how much time passed between the events in these past few chapters of Abram's life? Sometimes it could be months, days, years. But we know that at the right time, at the right moment, God spoke the promise. When did God, when did Abram hear after these things and receive the protection and the promise of blessing and reward? At the perfect time. That's when he received it. And sometimes we think, okay, Lord, I hadn't heard from you. Well, he's going to speak. 
as we continue to trust in him and grow through him, we need to look inside and say, okay, Lord, what am, what am I um, uh, waiting for? Am I waiting for you? Or are you waiting for me? <laughs> and and uh, many times we just need to trust in him that his timing is perfect. So he receives this promise of very great blessing. Psalm 35 verse 27 says this, let them say continually, the Lord be magnified who delights in the prosperity of his servant. The Lord not only wants to, um, well, I mean, let me put it this way. Depending on your background in church and whatever, you may have found yourself um, thinking, okay, the Lord's going to give me what I need when I need it. That's true. But does the Lord want to give us enough to eke by? Or does he want to prosper us? I believe he wants to bless us. Think of, uh, of, of a heart of a parent. Do we want our children just to barely make it? Or do we want them to make it and prosper and win in life? Well, of course, well, that same heart that we have for our children is the heart that God has for us because we're made in God's image. And so uh, that's a good way to look at this promise that God made to him and that he makes to us. We are his servants as well. He delights, delights in the prosperity of his servant. Verse two, and Abram said, O Lord God, what will thou give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, since thou hast given no offspring to me, one born of, in my house is my heir. So Abe's getting a bit grumpy, but he also is doubting once again. God just spoke to him that he's going to have all these things and all these blessings and all this prosperity in his, in his generations Abram thinks his situation is impossible. And it is. Because he's looking at his own circumstance. Back in chapter 12, verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring. Look at that verse. Chapter 12, verse 7. To your descendants. In other words, in other, NIV it says, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. If the Lord made a promise, the Lord's going to do it. But it's impossible with me. It's impossible with man. How's God going to do it? That's not for Abram to figure out. That's for God to take care of. In this chapter today, we're going to see one of the most awesome, amazing things and concepts and realities of Scripture, and that is the concept and the promise of the covenant. And when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So Abram, just like us, is looking at his circumstances. He's looking at his own ability, right? His own, the, the, the ability of his own body. He's not looking at God's promise. God just spoke to him again. And yet he's looking still at the circumstance. So God responds with verses four through five. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, meaning Eliezer, but one who shall come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be, or so shall your offspring be. Let's pause there. So God responds. So God, God, God comes and speaks. And God says, Abram, I'm your great reward. I'm your protection. Don't need a fear. There's wonderful things in store for you. And Abram says, great, God, you're awesome. This is wonderful. No, Abram says, how are you going to do that? Only person I have. And he starts looking at how is he going to figure it out? Just like we do, right? So God takes him by the ear and he says, what's your problem? Right? Isn't that what verse 4 says? What do you see in verse 4 and 5? You know what I see? I see grace. I see patience. He, he, he Right in the face of Abram, totally not believing what he just heard from God, he tells God, rather, God tells Abram, let me just show you. He just patiently, like he's so patient with us, 
The Lord, it says, is abounding in patience towards us. Patiently takes him outside and rephrases the promise by giving him a kind of a, a picture in the stars of the promise. Like Abraham, we all will come to a place, each of us, where we will have to decide, will I trust God? When all I have to go on is his word. Will I still trust him if I don't see him working? The songs we chose this morning, you may have seen a theme. Waymaker was mentioned in the first song, in the third song. And the last song says, even when I don't see him, he's working. Even when I don't see you, you're moving. Even when I can't figure it out, you're doing something. That's faith. Each of us have the faith to trust in Jesus for our salvation. Sometimes that's easier than trusting him for how are we going to make that car payment? Or that what am I going to do about the relationship? Or I've got this awful job challenge that I'm facing. Or the myriad of things we see in our culture today and the challenges there. So like Abraham, we all will come to the place many times in our walk with Jesus where we have to decide, will I trust God when all I have to go on is his word? So God shows him these things and then something happens in Abram. In verse 6, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoneth to him as righteousness. He believed in the Lord. We talked last week about um, how our relationship with God starts with our intellect. We understand the gospel, and then we receive Christ in our heart, and we rely completely on his salvation, and then our relationship goes to the next step when the Lord gives us opportunities to trust in him with those faith tests that we have. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. I want to go back to this verse again and unpack a couple of things for us. This is the first mention of believed and righteousness. This verse, by the way, is only five words in Hebrew. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into the Hebrew. That's, uh, that's, we don't need to do that, but I'm going to show you the English words in Hebrew. Well, the English words, the five words. So the five words are believed, Yahweh, or it's actually by Yahweh, reckon, him righteousness. So we can insert there, he hath believed in Jehovah, Yahweh, and he reckoneth to him righteousness. Believed, Yahweh, reckon him righteous. You break it down like that, you see how simple faith is. How are you righteous? I believe his word. I believe what he said about my condition and about his salvation. So Abram believes in God. But again, as we saw last week, he's still not seeing the promises fulfilled. He's not seeing Sarah with a child. He's not seeing offspring. So he keeps on looking at his circumstances. He believes in God for salvation, but he's still not believing God. In other words, he's not talking more, pardon me, he is talking more about his circumstances than the promises of God. If we will focus on and talk about the negative things, the things that we can't control, the things that we can control, the things that are um, the problems that all we'll find our faith kind of getting squished. But if we'll talk about the promises of God out loud, meditate on those promises, we'll find our faith built up. And that's what we see in Abram. He continues to tell God, you can't do that, you see, <laughs> because there's just Eliezer. And next week, we're going to see Ishmael. And so there's these things that he can do, and he can say, okay, God, 
therefore, here's what, I've got a solution for you. And we do the same thing. God says, here's what I want to do for you. I want to move in your life. I want to use you mightily and use your gift and so forth and so on. But God, I can't do that. Exactly. That's why I called you. You can't do it. I'm going to do it through you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in all the world. Jesus promised in Acts 1. And so Abram believes in God, but again, he's not seen the promise fulfilled yet because he's not believing God. He's not standing on that faith and, and taking it to the next level. The key to faith is continually saying what God has said. Faith is not activated by speaking our circumstances. Jesus, over in John 8, verse 26, said this. And this is, this is such a, a perfect example of um, our Lord never speaking his circumstances. He said, the one who sent me is true. So I say in the world only what I have heard from him. Jesus only said what he hears from the Father. That's a good word for us. When Jesus was faced with 5,000 men plus women and children who were hungry, and there was one little lunch, they said, Lord, what are we going to do? He said, well, obviously you have no food. You got to go get something. He was, he was not looking at the circumstances. He was listening only to what the Father said. And the Father was saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something and show them my power through you. And that's when things happened. He lifted it up. And he gave thanks for what was available. I believe when God puts something into our hands, he says, here's what you have. And we think, it's just it's a loaf and two little bitty sardines. <laughs> he says, watch what I'm going to do. If you'll offer it up in thanksgiving to me and watch me move through your gifts, what, you take the first step and let me do the rest. You take the step of faith, and I will move on your behalf. Does that make sense? Good. Good. Verse 7. And he said to him, this is the Lord speaking, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to possess it. And he said, Abram, Oh Lord God, how may I know that I shall possess it? Do you know what just happened there? God's word was not enough. So God, in just a moment, we'll get to it. In just a moment, we're going to see God's going to counter once again by taking him by the ear and saying, aren't you listening to me? No, he's not. He's going to say, okay, let me patiently show you what I'm going to do. Aren't you glad God's patient with us? I'm very glad about that. Here's what we need to glean from verses 7 and 8. He says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. What is God doing there? He's reminding him of what he's done. He's reminding him of what he's done. Here's what we need to do in our life. We need to remember the God stories. You have a God story that God did, not just your salvation, but your back was against the wall. You didn't know what you were going to do. You prayed, you trusted, you waited, God moved. Write those down. Keep a journal of those. Keep an annual book. Say, okay, this year, this let me go back and recount those stories of what God did. April and I talk about how many times we prayed for healing for the children and how many times God has healed amazingly, miraculously. And we remind each other of that. He's the same God. God speaks to Abram and says, remember how I brought you out? I'm going to continue going with you. So remember the God stories. Judges 5 says this in verse 11. There they shall recount the righteous deeds of the Lord. In other words, write them down so you'll have faith for the new challenge. Go back to Waymaker and how God makes a way 
y'all know we've been going through the process of bringing three young little girls home um, to our family and welcoming them and raising them as our own. And uh, we've had challenges, a lot of challenges. Did you notice there's a crisis at the border? Anybody notice that? Well, that affected us directly because immigration got bogged down and something that could have taken about a month, maybe two, took 90 days. And so we're seeing the clock tick and things happening, things getting drawn out. And there was one instance in which we had some paperwork that we thought was going to take at least two weeks, maybe even they, they told us a month. It took two days for us to get paperwork. So on the one hand, we saw things getting really slowed down. On the other hand, we saw things go just so rapidly. There was also an example of the uh, immigration that had, um, the way they interact and interface with the adoption agencies is usually email, snail mail, hardly ever is there a phone call. We had an instance about maybe two weeks ago where things were progressing moderately, but they needed to hurry along. Immigration called, phoned the agency. They emailed us and said, that's never happened. Never happened. And so again, that's Waymaker, the verse that God keeps giving us, I'll make a roadway in the wilderness, streams in the desert, and also the Red Sea passage where they walked across on dry land. None of that's possible with man. And so we've been seeing him time and again. You know, we're trusting him for finances. We're trusting him for paperwork. We're trusting him for timing, for staying healthy when we travel. Um, and we, we have lots of, of uh, challenges, I guess I could say, still ahead of us. Opportunities, yes. Opportunities still ahead of us that we are uh, looking for um, God to move. But it's good to look back at what he's done so far. And that encourages us. And I want to encourage you to do that, to, to remember those God stories so you can continue to trust him for tomorrow's and the way he will move on your behalf. All right, go back to verse 9. So Abram once again doubts, Oh Lord God, how may I know that I shall possess it? Well, I just told you, bonehead. I mean, you know, I kind of expect God to say that sometimes. <laughs> Boy, you know, but he doesn't. God said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And if you only read the word, if you're just reading the word for the first time, you're thinking this sounds like a weird pagan ritual, right? This is like, what's happening here? And then you see the next part, it's even weirder. Then he brought all these to him and Abram cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. And let's pause there. So this is a local custom. This is something that Abram was already familiar with, uh, that was predated written contracts, that people would say, okay, if we're going to have an agreement, a promise with each other, we're going to take some animals, cut them in half, put them on either sides, then we're going to join hands with each other, like arms, and we will walk between the pieces and the statement is that if I break this promise, may it be done to me as was done to these animals. That was the way they made that legally binding promise to each other. So Abram is told by God, go get some animals. Abram's like, ah, I know what you're doing here. So God's moving and he's um, showing Abram something that he's already familiar with. And he said, okay, I'm going to, uh, Abram knew exactly what he needed to do. So he starts getting them ready for this covenant establishment, okay? So God works through the local customs. In Jeremiah 34, before we move on, it says, it also says in Leviticus 1, it says, the men who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of my covenant they made before me will treat, pardon me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. So in other words, may it be done to me if I break this covenant. And then we see verse 11, the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and they drove them away. Birds are always a picture of the enemy. 
We see the birds making their nests in the trees and the parables of Jesus and the birds coming to steal in the seed in the parable of Jesus. We see that the enemy is here trying to mess with the covenant. Okay, that's, that's what that's a picture of for us. The birds he's trying to drive away. And so he's doing his part to keep them away. And uh, they're trying to, to mess with what God is doing. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. So now he's going to sleep. That is important. Make a note, underline in verse 11, a deep sleep fell upon him. God is going to speak to Abram in a dream at night. Previously spoke to him in a vision. In a vision, you're wide awake. You have a vision, you're in prayer, you have a vision of something, you're seeing that vision. A dream is different. God can speak to dreams and visions. The word speaks of both. But it says terror and great darkness. This is a supernatural darkness that overcomes him. And it's telling of a very dreadful time period. Let's look. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and shall be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about when the sun had set, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. God's presence. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Kadmonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Ref- and, and the Rephaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, the Jebusite. So that, that defines all the land. We'll look at that in just a moment. Let's go back because here he's been promised you're going to have offspring and have all these things and they're going to be enslaved 400 years. And that might be where Abram said, you know what? I'm okay without this promise. That's, that doesn't sound like a good promise. Uh, I'm a, we can just go ahead and get to choose somebody else. But to his credit, he, he doesn't say that. I don't think Abram was ready to hear that part of the promise in chapter 14, 13, or 12. But he was ready to hear it here. He wasn't ready at that point. And God is only going to tell us and disclose to us and call us to things when we're ready in our faith to go and do those things in faith. So Abram receives an understanding of the future that there will be strangers 400 years, and we know that is when they were slaves in Egypt. And God did, as it says in verse 14, judge Egypt as he released them with his mighty, strong arm. And we also know in verse 15, he was buried, he died and was buried at a good old age of 175 years old. So he's about midlife at this point, (laughs) is Abram. Um, And so he uh, dies at an old age. And then the fourth generation return here and says, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete, meaning that God still had to, um, he had judgment that he was still dealing with for the people in that area. The sun had set and then a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. Uh, We see that the Lord accompanied the Israelites in Exodus by day as a pillar of cloud, by night as a pillar of fire. And we see him in different places showing up as a cloud, as Moses is on the mountain with the Lord, a cloud descended right upon there. And we also see the the burning bush, the fire. So we see the Lord in these different manifestations, cloud and fire. The main thing we need to know here and understand is it was God's presence. But also, let me ask you something. Where's Abram? Asleep. When a covenant was made, both people walked between the pieces of the sacrificial animals, like we said. But in this case, Abram was asleep. So God makes the covenant alone. It's called a unilateral covenant versus a bilateral covenant. Uni meaning one. When God makes a covenant, that means he alone will make sure 
that the promise is fulfilled. A covenant is simply a promise. He's going to make sure the promise is fulfilled. Was 400 years fulfilled as far as we, we, he didn't see it yet, but do we understand that 400 years was fulfilled? Yes? Check. We got that. Did Abram live a good to low, a uh, good old age? 175? Check. We got that. Because that's beyond the average age of people living at that time. But what's the other one? I will give this land, verse 18. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Josh, let's look at that map. And uh, I want us to find Israel, modern day Israel, on the map when it comes up. Because it's a little different if you look at these boundaries that are just described here from what we see uh, in our in modern day Israel. What this is called, and you can find this, you can just go in and do a search for Genesis 15 map, and you'll, you'll get many options. And so I want y'all to look. Y'all see where Israel is? Y'all see Jerusalem? And Israel is that little sliver right on the Mediterranean. I mentioned before, it's equivalent to about, um, about three counties. If you take uh, uh, Madison County, Hines County, Rankin County, stack them on top, it's about the size of Israel. But look at the size of the promise. It goes into all of Syria, into Turkey, half of Iraq, or probably not all of Syria, half of Syria, half of Iraq, the northern part of Saudi Arabia, and the eastern side of Egypt, and Jordan, all of Jordan. So where's the promise? God promised 400 years that they would be captive. They were. God judged the nation that held them captive. Abram lived to a ripe old age, but then he promised this land. During the time, a short for a brief time during Solomon's reign and a brief time during Jeroboam's reign, that was their borders, but it was a very brief time. But that's a picture of greater Israel and what God promised will happen in the last days. That's going to be the size of Israel. God's promises, his covenant, he walked between the pieces by himself. He will see to it that not only that happens, but every other promise he's made to Israel. There are those who say Israel has been replaced. It's called replacement theology. Maybe you've heard about it, but it, they say that Israel's been replaced by the Christians, and there's the, all the things that he promised Israel are now just for the Christians. No, he's got a promise to the church worldwide, Jew and Gentile, and he still has promises to Israel that have yet to be fulfilled, and this is one of them. So in these days, in these times that we're in, we're going to see um, awesome things, beautiful things, and also some things that will increase our faith, opportunities for us to rely on the Lord and not ourselves. So I wanted to show you that uh, in, in concluding to be consistent with what we just read, but also to remind us all that God is faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his promise to you that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete that which he's begun. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Get those promises. Put them on a note. Put them on your mirror. Put them on your car dashboard. Meditate on the promises. Say them out loud so that you'll be standing on the promises, like I said, rather than just sitting in the premises, <laughs> right? And we need to um, uh, see the Lord do things, and we can see the Lord. He wants to do, and we want him to do things that are beyond our ability. And that's when... Um, that's when our faith, faith grows, get our eyes off our circumstances onto our Savior. Amen? All right, well, let's all stand and let's pray and close. And as we're praying, if there is something that you have been carrying 
make sure you receive prayer today for that. If you tuned in and there's something that you're carrying that is a burden, and the Lord spoke to you today about that, please make sure to reach out and let us pray for you. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for being so gracious to us, so good to us. Thank you, Lord, that your promises are yes and amen, all of your promises, meaning you said it, it's done. It's going to happen. Lord, I pray you would increase our faith through your word, through us standing on your word, us even saying out loud what your word is to us, your promises. May we say those and meditate on those much more than we meditate on the things that are not of you, Lord. May we focus on your ability rather than our own. So, Lord, take your word that you've spoken to us today, plant it deep within our hearts, and bear fruit for your kingdom. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.